uh, and generally um, managing lots of data in the modern world. Um, but I'm going to go back a bit a bit longer than that. And my my job in the Turing actually my job title is researcher at large, um, and I'm not actually fundamentally an AI expert, although I actually have supervised PhD students and written papers. Uh, in multiple uh, areas of machine learning and AI. I'm a kind of user of different technologies, but having been in the Turing for five years and read a couple of hundred papers, I sort of feel like I've done about a PhD's worth of uh, work in various areas. Um, but a lot of it, I think the key key uh, take home, if you want to skip to the end and have, go and have a cup of coffee for the next half hour, a lot of the work in places like the Turing and the University of Cambridge is, is cutting edge. And there's a really big gap between something that's, that's you know, cutting edge or bleeding edge uh, in a research institute and things that get used in the real world. And that's been my experience uh, in, in many areas that I've worked in, um, classically in networking, actually, for the first uh, 10 years of uh, working on the internet from 1980 to 1990. Many people told me you could never do packet switch video and audio real time between people. It wasn't going to work. And here we are using Zoom uh, only 40 years later. Uh, and so uh, a billion other people. So clearly that you know, took a while to persuade people, but also to get some of the bugs out. Um, and so obviously that, that, that's one of the, the lessons in looking at the landscape of different technologies is thinking about their readiness for use uh, uh, in, you know, in anger uh, in, in, um, uh, and in, in the real world. Um, so one of the things we're interested in, in this particular talk, I'm interested in, in extracting structure from uh, data that is often unstructured. And of course, this is as old as the hills. In fact, uh, you know, librarians, of course, are the keepers of structure uh, um, in the form of uh, indexes. <laughs> and so you, know, you go into the University Library in Cambridge, which is a copyright library, has a copy of everything. Um, but if it was just a heap, it might take a while to find one of the uh, quite a few million works there. If you just gave the poor librarian a title and author and said, where is this? Unless it's incredibly popular near the front. Aha, there's some structure. But of course, if they have an index uh, and it actually points to where in the stack the thing lies, then all things become uh, jolly good. And so databases came out of that kind of world a long time ago. And uh, an awful lot of what goes on in the world today you know, is a little bit of statistics run over databases. An awful lot of dealing with the pandemic has been taking uh, patient record data or case uh, occurrence data and running some fancy stats on it. And the statistics can be um, 100 years old. Um, so having a bunch of commas separated values is, a, is an Excel file, as long as you don't use Excel format brackets in HS error uh, number two, um, uh, you know, is, is a perfectly reasonable way of exchanging data, which you then do some you know, fancy rows and columns statistics on. And obviously there are other kinds of uh, structure you can introduce the data, um, classical things to you know, divide and conquer through hierarchy, and also graph data is very, very interesting. Um, but of course, that's that's often data that you have inherently some simple uh, tabular forms or some other structures. Um, sometimes you have what well, looks of, looks of, appears to be unstructured data in the first place, uh, and that's certainly uh, some of the things we're interested in in our KBA and what many people are interested in is looking at the stuff that initially looks to be unstructured, uh, and then see if we can extract some structure in it. Um, and um, you know that could just be. Uh, a job for machine learning. Some very fancy AI techniques, Bayesian uh, inferencing is, is one uh, particularly uh, attractive, underused approach. Uh, maybe just, again, just some counting, some statistics, looking at uh, distributions might actually help with some things. So, um, so one example of unstructured data that, in, in fact, when you get up close to it, 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 it looks to be horribly unstructured in multiple ways. I, I think that the, you know, people may be unfortunately too familiar with is doctor's notes. And so I mentioned um, things like patient records in, in the health service, uh, which are quite structured. Uh, you know, there's, there's a patient name and an NHS number, a date of birth, and then a number of uh, code points that indicate various uh, symptoms or uh, conditions and on states of onset and presentation of treatments of various kinds. And there are codes assigned for all of those. And clearly that's spreadsheet type stats can be done, although you can do very interesting things with comorbidity statistics and so on. But then of course the, there's the human in the loop, which is typically the doctors and nurses uh, who scribble notes on, on you know, a, a piece of paper at the end of the bed or whatever. Um, and you look at them and you think that just looks like noise. But in fact, at, at one level, it looks like noise because doctors infamously have uh, illegible handwriting 
until you're familiar with the doctor's writing. And then it turns out each doctor uh, has the same kind of signs they make, very similar signs each time they scribble the same kind of thing about a patient. Um, and so actually recognizing the handwriting is not the general problem of recognizing anyone's handwriting and understanding it, uh, it becomes a specific problem for that doctor. Uh, and typically, if you ask the nurse what the doctor has written, they will have learned it, and then you can actually code, get a code point from that, and a very simple translation problem. And of course, the doctor's not writing random things in their notes. They're not writing, you know, a short introduction to the works of Mervyn Peake or, or uh, wherever else you like reading. Um, they are writing the same kinds of things about the same conditions uh, and the same kind of treatment, as, you know, uh, uh, trait statements. Why is my phone ringing? People calling me at work. How dare they? Um, it's quite funny. It's actually a spam call, and of course, spam is a great example of, um, uh, of a problem that can be solved to some extent uh, by machine learning. Um, the most common spam filters use a Bayesian uh, system where they just classify spam uh, according to what people have said previous spam looks like. So they have a bunch of priors and they say this spam looks like that spam, it's got this probability, therefore the similarity you know, between those two uh, call numbers or content of its text or its uh, images. Um, so that's quite interesting. And down the bottom of this slide, I've also put human mobility, which is super interesting. Um, a lot of people thought that uh, a good model of how humans move around in space um, would be would be random. But there's a thing called random waypoint where people choose a random direction, go for a random amount of time at a random speed. And it's interesting, statistically, uh, if you choose the right distributions for that randomness, you can get something that looks like human movement. But in fact, of course, people's movement is actually constrained by sources and destinations they want to go between and by means of transport that they use to get between those. So the large scale statistics may look similar, but the reality is that human movements is a predictable sequence of movements from uh, the kitchen to my office at home these days. Um, and Google Maps, for example, draws me a map is quite amusing over the last uh, year of looking at the dot that represents where I am on Google Maps. If you do highly precise location, you find I've been in two places. Every now and then I go around the 10 mile bike route to get a slight amount of exercise and fresh air. Um, um, and it turns out there are these cycles in the movement. And if you're building a model, for example, for predicting the effects of contacts during opening up after a pandemic, you might be interested in you know, having an accurate model, not just the large scale statistics. You might want to have localized models that say, well, uh, you know, people in London move around and a large fraction of them use the London Underground. People in Cambridge move around, some of them, about half of them, you know, taking their kids to school on bikes in the morning, bringing back in the evening. So about half of the commuters on bikes, which is quite different. And the, the source of destination be home, uh, school, and possibly workplace. Uh, and so then you can actually build precise contact distributions from that. Um, and uh, clearly you make some observations, you learn those mobility models from those, and then you can form a graph and then actually figure out what the frequencies of contacts are at various places in the graph. And if you want to target ads to people at those places that, you know, here we have cheaper masks, then you know, that would be an obvious thing you might use that kind of data for if you weren't invading privacy and possibly breaking the law. Um, okay, so um, of course all this data, uh, as soon as you start to look at it in more complicated ways, you might want to look at more than correlation between two things, like the probability somebody lives here and that they travel to that destination, or the probability that they're this age and they might be susceptible to some particular medical condition. And it may be you want to look at things that have multiple dimensions. So there's you know height, weight, gender, and so on. And uh, this is where you get into this dimensionality problem. So the data starts to be in each, each row in your medical data starts to have uh, just put your hand up if you know how many dimensions there are in the electronic health record in the NHS. They're potentially up to 10,000 if you enumerate it correctly. There are different ways of counting. It's not just Excel uh, columns, um, but that's a, that's a pretty high dimensional data set. Um, and if you're interested in asking questions, is there a correlation between these two features of a person and their likelihood of getting a particular condition seriously? Uh, that starts to be complicated if you don't know which things to look at. And so one of the things that a lot of um, statistics does, of course, is what I just said, is correlation. We do regression fitting. We just do, is this correlated with this and how well? But we can do that over multiple dimensions. But when you have a lot of dimensions in your data, one of the things about reducing complexity uh, is, is dimensionality reduction. So it's got one graph. I'm not going to go through this graph, but it's just about um, singular value decomposition and also principal component analysis and just fitting uh, lines in multiple dimensions 
but where you have too many dimensions, you want to choose the principal components. So you essentially find the most important dimensions. You find the hundred things that matter out of your 10,000 dimensions. And of course, in some data, there may be vastly more. And I just, just wanted to kind of mention that that's just the, the last point at which a lot of fancy statistics uh, uh, is used in anger in many, many places. That, that lets us pick out the things that matter. We're just trying to optimize the battery life of our mobile phone. And we want to figure out what are the things that matter? Is it the use of the Wi-Fi, the use of the cellular radio, the use of Bluetooth, the amount that you have the screen saver on or off, uh, the amount that the process is running something, and there's a whole bunch of dimensions there. And you can use uh, principal component analysis to find the three or four that matter most, and then concentrate on optimizing the system, for example, as a thing that we did in the past. Um, so, but moving on from simple statistics, um, I'm just going to mention what happens when uh, you, you want to build systems that manage a lot more data. Um, and there's a kind of sequence of four things in here, um, of four steps, uh, which are looking at uh, more complex ways of dealing with things um, and dealing with you know, very high dimensional data and large amounts of data in the input. And um, so deep learning has been around neural nets have been around for 30 plus years. And Jeff Hinton is probably one of the most famous people in the world uh, looking at this stuff. He's been in Toronto for decades, uh, crying in the wilderness going, yeah, this deep learning stuff works. And this very, very interesting um, um, problem for theoreticians. So deep learning works. Uh, you will see many results of deep learning. Uh, we train classifiers on large amounts of data. It, the easiest example is where you have pictures of cats and dogs and you show your neural net uh, a bitmap that represents a cat, a bitmap that represents a dog. And if it says, yes, it's a cat, and uh, yes, it's a dog, and no, it's not a cat, and it's not a dog, um, then you reward it and you increase the weights of the uh, edges in the neural net inside your convolutional neural net, whatever kind of neural net you have. And you do that um, over millions and millions of images. And eventually you get a thing that you can embed in your camera phone. And then when you point your camera phone at a cat and take a picture, it might automatically subtitle it, this is a cat. Uh, or it might just recognize a face and focus on that face. Um, so this works. Unfortunately for, for Jeff, for about 30 years, the theoreticians have been saying, we don't know why it works. Um, and that's actually a big problem for prime time use of neural nets. Now, of course, there are people using neural nets for uh, camera phones. It's not really safety critical uh, in such a trivial device. You get the cat wrong, you point it at a pink panther and it says, no, that's actually, I don't know, some other thing, which it probably will. And the first time it sees the pink panther, it will have no idea. Um, whereas a young child, of course, goes, oh, that's a cat. It's a pink cat, and it's a panther, I think. Um, so um, the neural net has no model of what's going on. It's just what it is, is it's a system that combines dimensionality reduction with a simple gradient descent statistical matching pattern recognition system. But that I've just, I've just uh, elided a huge number of things. How many layers are there in the neural net? You know, that's just, why did you choose that neural net architecture? How did you choose what the active learning step was? What was your gradient descent function at all? Uh, and so on, how many, how many times did you train it? And um, so getting neural nets to be reasonably good is quite expensive in terms of training. Of course, if you're gonna ship 500 million mobile phones and you want them to recognize faces, then not too bad uh, to do that. But if you have a new job you want to do and you've got a new collection of data, or maybe you don't have that much data, it can be problematic. So fairly recently, um, uh, and very successfully deployed by, by DeepMind, uh, there have been uh, generative adversarial networks, which is a pairs of neural networks where you have uh, essentially a, a generative network and a, a network that it is training. And these things evolve much faster. And this has actually allowed uh, DeepMind and other people who use general generative adversarial nets to tackle bigger problems more quickly uh, and somewhat more successfully. Um, that, that said, we still don't have a brilliant theory about them, how they work. And there's a couple of things here which are super interesting. The, the trained classifier of either of these systems can be compressed. In fact, it can be lossily compressed. So you take a classifier, which may be a fairly large bit of uh, fairly simple software, and uh, you want to fit it into a small uh, processor in your mobile phone. So you compress the, the edges in the neural net, you throw away a number of edges and nodes. You just think of the ones that look like, imagine you're doing a kind of MPEG compression on video. It's a similar trick. And the thing still works. 
And it's like, why does it still work? What was it what was important about those edges that, and that those nodes in the neural net that made them made successful? Um, so that's one aspect of the thing which suggests that we're doing something way too expensive. I already mentioned another thing which suggests this, which is young children shown a couple of cats can extrapolate from those from a model to a pink panther, which is very different than your furry you know, classical cat. Um, and so that model is the trick. Actually building a model from a neural net is, is a, a lot of work has been done to do that. In Cambridge, there's a guy in chemistry who has energy landscapes of uh, neural nets and shows that you can map them into random forests. But it's kind of a bit of a wrong way around. If you've got a way of, of doing uh, machine learning with a random forest, then why not do that in the first place? It's super cheap and quite effective. And there are other techniques that are super cheap and quite effective. Um, there are other people now finally starting to tackle explaining what's going on in the neural net. And that's going to, that's a whole new thing. Research topic, red hot research topic. People can crack that one. They will speed up the learning even further than GANs. They'll also potentially deal with um, why the compression works so well, what kind of compression will work, and also um, the other kind of adversarial input. So one of the applications of uh, neural nets has been uh, recognizing images, as I mentioned, but in particular, recognizing features in the road ahead of you in a self-driving car. And it's been shown that some of these systems don't distinguish well between a pedestrian and a cyclist, which doesn't make them very good for deploying a self-driving car in Cambridge. Um, but further, you know, very simple changes to the input can completely mess up the success of the classifier. And this was shown by students in Berkeley who took full, full to fooling self-driving cars by putting little duct tape over road signs, which would not fool a human for a second, but completely messed up the, the classifier in those cases. Again, explaining that is a little bit tricky. I mean, you, you, can, you can explain it. Um, typically depends on the neural net, whether you can work out some early work on, figure out what's going on inside there. It says, oh, this layer is in fact, in fact an edge detector and you've now added new edges. And so the edge detector has been messed up. Um, and this layer is some other feature detector. So approximately very much like the human brain actually. It's one of the few links that there may be some similarity between artificial neural nets and neuroscience. Although there's a lot of neuroscientists who shoot me for saying that, say, no, 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 it's completely and utterly different. And they're probably right. So moving on to more complex still, um, and amusingly in newspapers recently, uh, referred to as the obscure theory by an old mathematician who's actually uh, a priest in England a long time ago. The Reverend Bayes came up with this whole statistics from reasoning from prior knowledge into posterior knowledge um, that allows you to update your belief systems, uh, belief being not religious beliefs, but, but scientific beliefs, scientific method, if you like, of statistics. And um, the reason that Newspaper the application of that is how do you understand uh, the impact of false positive, false negative, um, and super interesting, uh, but also applied in many, many places in machine learning and definitely not obscure and definitely useful. And then the last thing, which is a red hot topic uh, and is, is probably going to move from being a research topic into being very, very useful much faster is a thing called FireML, the PHI there should be the letter phi from Greek uh, because the physicists like to show off their Greek symbols because of course they do because they have to know all the different things like eta and epsilon and pi and so on. And, um, and FireML is a very nice idea for having um, a, a slightly different thing from GANs. Um, the idea of FireML is you take a physics model where you actually have a, some very fancy equations that describe a system and you take an empirical model that's learned from data and you combine the two. Um, now, the classic example here is in um, turbine design. I think Rolls Royce are using this with some people in the Turing um, Imperial College in London, where they're worried about turbulent flow. And turbulent flow is one of these um, chaotic effects. And when you solve the equations for flow in a fluid, Turbulent flow is a mess because it happens at very fine grain initially. So when you build your um, your numerical evaluation of the physics model, you build an approximator that does finer element solutions. It takes little cubes and solves the equations in the cube and then propagates the results the next iteration in neighboring cubes and so on. But you can't choose the size of the cubes to deal with large and small scale, and you can't afford the computation for small scale. So what the machine learning does is you take the empirical results, you learn a model of where turbulent flow happens, then then run the physics model of fine grain there and coarse grain everywhere else. This is brilliant. It demonstrably works. So, and you have a model of what's happening, right? Which is based on the physics. So that's really great. 
So, um, uh, and I think it's, it's, extre it's more than promising. I mean, this is just, I've seen very cool. And that's just one example. There are many, many other examples where you have uh, first principles, physics models based in all kinds of decades of work on physics that are too complex to solve. This will work um, probably help with the protein problem that DeepMind do, where they're, they're, they're being GANs, but what they should be doing is injecting fire and muscle cell and combine those. And maybe they already are, just haven't published yet. Okay, so now that's uh, a range of different methodologies. Where I've tried to sort of go from a high level view of the methods down to deep dive into how they can be used in some areas. And of course they have applicability in many areas. But one of the, one of the areas that, that's super interesting um, and definitely is sort of IKVA interesting, but it's interesting to everyone is uh, is, is language and obviously uh, understanding language um, is has made you know, huge leaps with uh, Alexa and Siri and so on. All kinds of systems are clearly are really taking spoken words and turning them into uh, input that is, is comprehensible to programs in the sense that they are actionable, and that's pretty cool. Although in constrained, typically very constrained environments uh, with you know with interactions, so like I didn't get that, can you say again and whatever in a different way. Um, so this is an example which I'm going to going to reach reach my conclusion from uh, in this talk, um, which is um, a long time ago people thought very hard about languages in the early AI days, in the sort of first round of AI about 40 years ago. There were folks at MIT and Edinburgh University, at Sussex University, who are and, and Cambridge actually. Karen Spot Jones was a very famous Cambridge person. I'll never forget who thought about actually what the meaning of language could be, how it could be extracted. Could you comprehend language and could you generate language in a meaningful way by thinking about uh, you know, word orders, grammar, um, and the structure of things that are being said, uh, indeed even conversation. Um, and they built these really complex models uh, of what was going on uh, based in multiple natural languages and, and natural language processing sort of started there. But the successes, have happened by quite a different uh, method. And this is very much like the, the successes in, in neural nets and deep learning, where you have vast amounts of data you can process super fast, you take a much simpler approach. So doing things that are way too clever can firstly lead to things you can't explain, and secondly lead to things that can go wrong in ways you can't explain or predict. Um, and I can give actually a very recent example, but the, the, the famous system that's uh, the kind of leading edge of cleverness of using uh, 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 some amount of cleverness um, uh, is GPT-3, uh, which does do generation of what appear to be you know, naturally um, uh, uttered words by people um, you know, or typed by people. Actually, it's, um, it's not that clever. It's actually a combination of two statistical uh, tricks. So the, the main one is to crawl a very large amount of data, the common crawl over everything available publicly. Uh, then to learning on that, um, and there are all kinds of issues. There are not too many people have the resources to actually build such a system. Although they people have built that have kind of offered it for people to try out for those things, which is nice. Um, if you go back and build something based in uh, models of how language, how, how people construct uh, sentences, including how young kids construct new sentences they haven't constructed before, you come out with quite a different model. Um, but unfortunately, that requires a whole bunch of different cleverness, which is very smart people. Um, very much like the, the example I gave before, the FireML world, where you have, you're resting decades of physicists thinking very hard about problems, you know, people like Schrodinger or Einstein coming up with models of how things work, or Newton coming up with gravitational models of how motion works, or all the you know, Boyle, all the people who worked in those things, coming out with these equations, and then some smart people, scientists coming out with numerical ways to solve those equations, and then combine it with the machine learning. So the same thing with languages, not quite happening yet. Um, so, um, so combining things to, to combine this old school and natural language processing with a new system, not really there yet. And there are people trying to get back to that because clearly that would give us things that would, uh, for example, if you're doing natural language translation, you trans automatically translating from uh, geek to normal person <laughs> on the street. You're trying to explain some uh, math. What is an exponential? How do you explain that to the public? Um, that would be one, but you know, that, but more more seriously, let's say French to English or whatever. Um, 
when it goes wrong, it goes wrong in embarrassing ways, and this can be problematic. And, and Douglas Adams is a great example of intergalactic wars that broke out because of mistranslation. So plenty of examples. Um, but actually, what 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 uh, what I wanted to finish up, kind of head, head towards, is actually you go back to the simplest systems where. Um, in the old days, people did look at these, you know, vectors based of words, bags of words, and um, they had very slow computers. But now we have super fast computers, and more to the point, we have uh, scale out. We have the capability of taking a problem and firing up a number of computers on a problem. Um, so, um, uh, and you know, Cloudify, whatever you want to call it. So, uh, so to where the readiness for, for, for prime time use comes in is where is a problem something that you uh, can explain why it goes wrong. You can predict it's not going to go wrong, hopefully, but if it does go wrong, you can say, oh, we can, we can explain that and we can fix it. That will be kind of important. And deep learning has, has problems in that space. Um, there are, um, the fixes are mostly make it more expensive. Most of the people that have worked in, for example, there's some very cool, again, DeepMind and Google have worked on part specific counterfactual reasoning about what goes wrong with a, a convolutional neural net. Um, not just if you, not just you vary one of the inputs until you see a change. You say, "Aha, that's the thing," and you watch which edges fire up and where the weights on the edges. You actually uh, do this across multiple different mixes of input. It's a bit like um, adaptive trials of drugs in medical if you're into that space. Um, that's very good, except that you you've already spent a vast amount of time. Massively more expensive than the energy landscape work I mentioned at every iteration in training. That is crazy expensive. Um, of these things, help you quantify uncertainty, give you confidence in the output of a neural net, and so they're important for people who put their faith and money behind neural nets. Um, it may be that understanding deep learning will lead to a massive improvement in efficiency of training the neural net, in which case that will be affordable, but not yet, not in, not ready for our kind of time zone anyway. Um, uh, certainly fun research area. Um, and transparency and confidence, you know, is kind of important. Um, if you're using a neural net to classify features in a medical image, um, it's okay if it suggests there might be a problem to the doctor and the doctor then gets an extra test that they then look at and the extra test gives you very high certainty. Um, so that's okay. But if it's something that's suggesting, you know, that a car needs to slam emergency brakes on and turn left, or whatever, uh, this is probably not okay. And so there's a kind of you know, readiness for sort of applicability. And then the other thing is this, um, um, if, if you're having to acquire models or simply statistics of new systems frequently, then you want something that the both stages of the input, the training and the use are both cheap. So training in neural nets is expensive, but classifiers, once you've got them, can be pretty cheap and you can compress them to make them cheaper and you can do other tricks with accelerator hardware and you know, TPUs, GPUs, other things in the phone exist uh, or on, on, on the desktop on the tablet. Um, but that doesn't help with, uh, if you have lots of rapidly changing landscape on the input side um, and you have you know, many different problems to solve. So for example, in environmental research right now, um, it's suddenly been, realize that there are very large numbers of sensors in the environment that are telling us all kinds of different things that are going on, but people have only built large models of oceanographic and atmospheric systems. And it's about time that we kind of took these vast numbers of tiny system models and acquired you know, models of what those are doing. And they're all changing all the time as well. So you need to, need to do things quickly there. Um, so that's sort of keep it simple, you know, sort of simple as possible and you know, as simpler is really crucial. And I mentioned things that, you know, just based on vector spaces, techniques like random forest linear regression allow you to quantify uncertainty. They're also amenable to scale out on both sides of the training and the use case. They also are amenable to acceleration. All these systems are amenable to acceleration. If you have something that the training is faster, it accelerates even more. So you've got fast vector or matrix operators based on GPUs, whatever. Then your simple system accelerates really well too. And uh, they're probably easier to spot the opportunities for parallelism uh, the, the parallel training neural nets leads to uh, all kinds of problems with um, exchanging gradients between processes, which we can have a whole discussion about. And Morton and I have both done work in that space uh, with with Niang, which is one of the other founders. Um, and uh, it's still a hot topic. You know, how do you make that actually work well? So, so that's the sort of end of my talk. And you may wonder why I've got a picture of Eland in, in that's in um, Kenya there. Um, and the reason is just uh, because. Um, that's the biggest mammal in Kenya, I think. But anyway, um, of that type.
No, they're big on animals, aren't they? Elephants. <laughs> um, so, uh, but the idea is keep it uh, as simple as possible and no simpler. Um, the creature is there to make you ask the question, why is that creature there? And what is the question they should be asking next? Um, the other picture there is, uh, is actually uh, um, to do with confounders. And um, if you're into uh, figuring out what's a causal inference that's correct, you know, A causes B, it's not just correlated, you have to worry about a confounder. And I'll just leave that picture there as one of the um, uh, Judea Pearl's uh, graphical way of explaining confounders. And we can talk about that offline or in the pub later, uh, where later is not today yet, but in the coming weeks, hopefully. Okay, that is the end of my talk. So uh, over to you all. Okay, thanks very much, John. Um, so what we're going to do now is we've got uh, John and we've also got uh, Professor Richard Mortier uh, with us. Uh, so both professors from Cambridge University, as we said before. Um, so just going to really open it up to, to Q&A. So if you've got any questions that you uh, want to ask these guys, uh, then please just put a message into the, the chat window. Uh, I have got a couple that have come in by uh, email to start off with. So, uh, so just while people are thinking about what questions to ask, uh, I'm just going to start off with these. Uh, so the first one, this is probably a, a question to, uh, to you, um, Mort, uh, which is, um, how does IKVA make use of all this technology and techniques in its own solutions? Mort, you're on mute. <laughs> Walt says he can't unmute. Hang on a second. Oh. Thanks. Sorry, because uh, the host has uh, missed everybody, so I needed to be asked to be unmuted. Um, yeah, so I think uh, the, I guess the answer I'd give to that is that we're, we're not fanatical about any of these technologies, particularly uh, the way we view our platform is as a mechanism for taking the, the technologies we, the, that John's talked about, some of, the, some of which John's talked about, um, and trying to make them available and applicable to uh, sort of everyday problems. Um, so in fact, one of the things that we've just uh, recently done in the last week or so we've got spun up is a more experimental infrastructure where we're going to be able to try out, uh, more easily try out instances of some of these technologies to experiment with them and see see how we can make them applicable and how we can make them useful. Um, I think the the uh, the approach we're taking is definitely to try and, to try and take, as John said, Near the start of the talk, to try and take some of these technologies and, and make them make them easily useful by people. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Uh, another question we've had come in uh, by email. This one is uh, is quite a broad one, uh, perhaps both for, for John and Mark. Which is uh, which techniques work best for qualifying uncertainty? I think I'll let John take that one. Take that one first. Um, yeah, so it's, it's down to uh, it's down to basically statistics. If you have a statistic like um, something says this is correlated with you know with X, like in a regression fit, then you have the higher moments of the distribution from that statistic. So basically, you have a standard deviation or variance. So you can put confidence. So you can and you can do that over more than a couple of dimensions. So then you can say, okay, this is correlated with that, with uh, you know, certainty bounded by your know, 95% confidence limits in the simple sense, but you could do that with, with um, more dimensions and other kinds of statistics. Um, and the more complex you make the system, then the more com complicated it is to extract that uncertainty. Uh, and basically, if you get to a neural net, the way you do it is you have to run the training with perturbations to see what the outcomes are by varying inputs and measure those, which means, of course, you in in increase the expense of the, of the training. Uh, so that's kind of at, at each end of the complexity of, of quantifying uncertainty. Um, but uh, it is uh, it is quite uh, simple to do if you're simply looking at a vector distance between two systems in a space, and you've got a number of different vectors you can measure that for. You can look at the variation in that, and then write down a variance for that, and that will say how confident you are that this is like that. Um, so um, it's, um, but yeah, the, 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 all the more sophisticated systems I mentioned uh, make it trickier. Um, the interesting case is where you have um, the physics ML stuff, where you actually have the physics model and you, uh, you um, solve the physics model iteratively with some numerical method um, to some level of precision. 
you a priori have uncertainty quantified in that, which is very nice. So your machine learning was only used to figure out where you need to look in more detail in the physics model. So that's cool. That won't work in sort of hybrid language model work, um, as far as I can tell. I might want to check the latest literature on that, because I'm not sure how we how uncertain you can be about ambiguity, for example, in sentences. But um, there is loads of work on that. Um, very interesting. What Sorry, I was going to say uh, one thing I'd, I'd add to that as well is that there's a, it's interesting how you choose to communicate that, I think, as well. So um, being able to quantify it is one thing, but then being able to communicate that usefully to people using the system is another. So uh, an example, maybe a, a slightly trivial example would be um, our the Mott McDonald Ventures ecosystem visualizations that we've built, uh, where we're presenting. You can think of that as presenting information in a graph format rather than a list. Uh, most, you know, most traditional search systems present a list of results ranked. Uh, from best to worst. Um, I think being able to show that sort of interconnections and linkages between uh, different results uh, conveys can, could convey much more information than simply trying to rank things as a, you know, top is best, second is less good than top. Okay. Thanks, guys. I've got another question here from uh, Nick Holliman. Um, simple is a relative term. Does machine learning have to be intelligible, intelligible to humans? After all, we don't understand human learning. I mean that, yeah, that is the that is classic question, um, and 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 typically, I mean, the, the solution, the the answers depend on the context. And you know, going back to the medical example I give all the time, when you get a vaccine, a doctor will hopefully sit next to you and explain the side effects and probabilities and what the vaccine's for and so on. Um, and they have interpreted much more complicated instructions that have been acquired from AstraZeneca, Pfizer, et al, um, which are based on statistics, you know, the very ongoing, all the time, constantly working out what side effects are, which are, you know, is a form of machine learning and, and risk because there's confidence, uncertainty and all of that. And so you need, um, most people would need an interpreter for that, you know, so, so the, the saying what the, that risk is. And I think that's going to uh, apply in many places of saying, you know, um, yeah, we can we can have a simpler system um, that we can make faster because we can understand as computing people how to optimize it, you know, to run it parallel, speed it up. But that that doesn't necessarily mean its output is is simpler to explain to somebody. That is, if if it achieves the same goal, uh, it may be just as complex. And so we may need to uh, have. Let me give an example. A concrete example is comparing court cases to see which court cases changed the interpretation of law with regard to employment, which became interesting because of Uber and what is the gig economy. And there's a whole bunch of work doing machine learning over the text in court cases. It was actually a, uh, an example on TV a couple of weeks ago. Um, anyway, so. Um, the you have to get the lawyers in the room to examine the court cases, even though your machine learning team says, I think the definition of employment changed in this case, you know, from this thing being an indicator to this. Um, and then the lawyer will go and read the thing as an expert and you will probably get several lawyers to independently say that. So I think uh, depending on the, you know, what the, the context is, yeah, you, you, you need to have this uh, sort of two level human in the loop and, and, and the machine output as well. Cool, thanks John. Uh, I've got a question here from John Williamson, which is, um, what is IKVA's unique selling point and competitive advantage? Uh, which actually is probably more of a question for me <laughs> than uh, either, either for, for John or more. I'll just try, we didn't want this to be a, a salesy pitch, but I'll just, John, I'll just try and answer that very, very quickly. I think there's three things that we can do at IKVA, which makes us a little bit different to anybody else. So number one, using these vector mapping techniques that we use as the uh, kind of the foundation for our technology. It means we can actually index a lot more uh, data than most other traditional NLP based systems can, which actually means we can increase the size of the corporate knowledge base. Secondly, when you are trying to access that knowledge, the techniques we use, meaning we use a much fuller context of information from the user, mean that we can actually greatly increase the accuracy and relevancy of the results that we give back to the user. And then thirdly, uh, we can do this completely language agnostically. So again, our technology using these vector mapping techniques means that uh, we're completely language agnostic, which means you can search uh, in an archive created in one language against uh, using a search query created in, in any other. And using these three things together, we believe that this you know, greatly reduces the time spent searching uh, and also increases the accuracy so that it reduces a business cost. And also because we can proactively provide information to end users, we actually greatly reduce the business risk uh, to an organization because we are providing information 
that people may not have even known existed. So that's it, end, end of sales pitch. Um, so, uh, so hopefully John, that kind of uh, answers your question there uh, very, very quickly. Uh, another question here from uh, Shafiq. Um, how do you go about testing and ensuring that algorithms are doing their job? Um, this is a, also a great question. Actually, it's a great example. When we, we were doing the, the work with the BBC, am I allowed to talk about the demo we did for the BBC of looking up news articles and we're looking at, I don't know, boats stuck in the sewers or something. And then um, the BBC person, the journalist, I think, said, this is great, you're finding all these articles. Well, what happens if you look for articles in Arabic? And then we looked for articles in Arabic and it came up with a list of, we came up with a list of articles. It was amazing, super fast. And then it was like, nobody, including the journalist, spoke and read any Arabic. So we had to call up some friends quickly and say, do these articles look, do they look relevant to that search that we did, you know, with this, this doc, we gave this document. And it was like, well, yes, they're really, they're, they're exactly what I would look for. Um, so that's kind of, that's not a great answer because obviously you want to do this quantitatively and, and it goes back a little bit to quantifying uncertainty. Now, obviously you can test this over lots of data and one of the advantages of taking these simpler, faster approaches is that we can try things over a lot of data um, and then look at the, the confidence we have in the outputs. Um, so I think that sort of keeps a, a lid on creeping complexity because we do want to keep improving in, in, in that in, ensure or assurance i guess um and and it also kind of it's one of the interesting problems with some of the more fancy tech deep learning techniques which which i would avoid because the cost of testing those is very very high i'm not saying it's impossible but it's really crazy high so it's kind of counterindicated by by problems where you keep getting new data sets to look at okay cool thanks john um question here from ian um, it was stated that, that in machine learning, you can just use more and more data to get better results, but that demands more commute, compute. Sorry. In the real world, what do you need to do to make that equation work in a continually affordable way as we demand more accuracy and have more data? So uh, I can say from our perspective, one of the things we're trying to do there, I think, is um, essentially subdivide the data. So rather than treating it as one massive data set, this is the, the comment we sometimes make that we're not trying to be Google. We're not trying to put all the data into one bucket and learn things about it. Um, we're, we're willing to be specialized and to take different cuts through the data, different subsets of the data, um, and sort of train up on that so that we can give accurate answers, accurate results in, in different contexts and pay, pay attention to that. So rather than essentially, rather than creating an enormous problem that's very difficult, uh, try and as far as possible to maintain it as a set of smaller problems uh, that are easier to handle. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Uh, another question, general question. Um, what do you think of GPT-3? Um, yeah. It, <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it's, um, it, it's, it's quite impressive at some level. Actually, if people are interested, there's a, there is an article today on uh, somebody used it to write jokes based on Star Wars characters and what they might say, and none of—it's quite amusing because none of the jokes is funny, um, and so it, it's a good example where the text is not wrong and it has the form of a joke without the actual uh, effect of a joke. Um, and I think that illustrates really what the problem is if you don't have a model of what's being meant, um, because if you have a model of what's being meant, you tackle. Uh, the, the, the inverse that's often the case in a joke. I mean, not all jokes are just reverse meaning, but you know, puns and using deliberately the wrong meaning and juxtapositions and so on. And, and of course, irony where people, you know, the context of somebody saying something matters. And it's, it's still a challenge in an NLP today. Uh, for example, a lot of people are interested in dealing with online harms, not something like AVA I think is involved in, but the government would love us to tackle, you know, hate speech online and the real problems. Um, um, but it's actually a, a problem if you have, imagine a group of researchers discussing online harms in social media, they would give examples. And if there was such a system running, it would keep flagging them up as being, you know, bullying each other or, or being hateful to each other. And the reality is they're, they're in quotes. Um, but of course, the system can't tell that context because it doesn't actually have this underlying meaning. The, the illocutionary acts and other structures that happen in, in conversation now you you can go back to much earlier work on NLP and, and try to do that. It's very hard. I know lots of people doing that because there's a good a good example way why we need it. Um, 
but yeah, GPT, it's GPT-3 is the sort of state of the art of a system that's done a huge amount of data to train a system. It's pretty good for that kind of system. Its limitations show that it hasn't broken through a new barrier. Uh, it's just scaled up. Um, okay, cool. thanks, Mark. Um, another question here, um, more about uh, IKVA. Why did you choose the technology you did at IKVA instead of other more traditional techniques such as NLP? Uh, I think it was just it was a question of uh, what could we do that we thought would be most useful most easily. Um, so we, we do use uh, some of these technologies that John's talked about. So we have some uh, neural net technology as part of part of our stack. Um, but I think uh, we we were primarily concerned with what yeah what what could we do that would be useful useful quickly that would address uh, address problems directly. Um, having said that, uh, even as a relatively young company, we iterated two or three times already. So there are some core components in the stack which have already had a couple of different attempts, a couple of different approaches tried um, before we've settled on where, where we're at now. As I said, part of what I, the way I see this going is we're trying to build up a library of techniques and implementations that we can we can then put together in, in useful ways uh, for people. Okay, cool, thanks Mark. Um, Nick, I know I see you've made some comments on, on some of that early conversation. I'm quite happy to unmute you if you wanted to just expand on those or not. So uh, <laughs> let me know if you want to do that. You can unmute yourself if you want. Um, with that, John seems to have frozen. Oh, that's a novel situation. Not sure how Zoom responds when the host goes away. That's, that's a novel okay. problem. Nick, did you uh, did you want to expand on that? Uh, as John suggested. Oh, we can't hear you. Uh, I can see you talking, but not hear you. So the discussion on the chat was basically Nick. There's, um, uh, let me see. Can I? Uh, um, yeah, Nick was suggesting that if you worked in a safety critical world, you'd want to you want to go through the kind of things that engineering approaches people do in in uh, autopilot. And I totally agree. Um, so uh, verification. Oh, I can't hear me now. That's great. <laughs> this is interesting. Zoom's got it in for us. <laughs> Uh, so I can still hear you, John. I haven't been able to hear Nick. Okay. And uh, it would appear that John Horden has had to drop off for some reason. It looked like his network connection may have uh, gone yeah. away. Okay, well, there you go. Um, so we have a question from Yasmin uh, to elaborate on industrial use cases we have in mind. Um, so I can say, I, I think... The general scope that we're looking at is, is text-based, so we're, we're primarily focused on documents, uh, textual documents, um, so unstructured data, hence the, the sort of the concept behind John's talk, I guess. Um, I think that we're initially focused on a number of cases in the legal sector and engineering sector where we have, uh, where we have markets where there's a lot of, uh, there is a lot of documentation and people have to make sense of large collections of quite complex, quite technically complex uh, documentation. That's not to say that we intend to, to focus solely on those, but I think that that's where we're looking at at the moment. So the sorts of things that we're, we're, we're looking at there, um, in a legal case, uh, preparation of case notes, uh, preparation of briefs, um, using the ability to plug in some of our technology to standard tools and workflows. Uh, so things like a Microsoft Word plugin that we have um, as, as people are developing briefs, as lawyers are developing briefs, being able to give them advice, give them access to information that's relevant to what they're doing at that point in time. Um, one of the very early demos we had was focused on the patent attorneys and the process of invention disclosure, being able to work out, help help attorneys work out what literature, both uh, patent-based, academic, and other forms of literature is, is relevant to uh, to uh, invention disclosures as they're developed and what, what prior art they can provide. Um, but we've also talked with uh, others. Oh, John's just messaged me on another channel to say Zoom has just crashed for him. So hopefully he'll be able to get, get back in shortly. Um, so... Uh, 
in other contexts, uh, things like standardized standards documents, uh, technical standards, uh, understanding the relationship between different technical standards. Um, this is more in the engineering uh, sense. Uh, the engineering case, we've we're talking with companies again. The sort of crossover between, I guess, between engineering and law. Things like uh, requests for proposals, contracts, contract management, uh, understanding which clauses overlap or have, have diverged. Ah, and John, I think, should be back. Just message saying John Horden is the host now. Um, I think there are there are a number of other things though where we are we're currently exploring uh, different options that are perhaps a little bit more different to traditional kind of document management and document management support systems. So um, we have a demo that involves a bug tracker system where we can try and provide software engineering teams with access to information, both in terms of the relationship between different bugs and bug reports and discussions of bugs uh, within a bug tracking system such as GitHub, um, but also augmenting that with uh, indexed content from uh, chat sessions. So Slack channels, um, Gitter channels, other instant messaging platforms where discussions take place that are outside the core tool, outside, outside in that case, for example, GitHub. Um, but it's useful to be able to bring together all that information from those different sources, different types of discussion, bring it together into one place to, to enable people to, to make use of it, uh, whereas perhaps previously it was difficult to do so. I think that illustrates the kind of workflow speed requirement for the system, which is um, which the demos kind of show, which is quite cool. Um, Okay, I'll hand back to John Horden at this point, who's managed to rejoin us. Yeah, sorry about that. The magic of uh, working from home, and um, I'm not sure what happened. Zoom crashed for me, so um, but apparently it was perfectly okay for everybody else. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I've also lost all my chat sessions, so I'm not sure if there's any more questions <laughs> that, uh, that people have got. So um, yeah, we, we, we answered a couple while, while you were out. Um, I just responded to Yasmin's question about industrial use cases. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm not seeing any um, others yet. No, I think we think we've covered everything up to that point. There was, I think, um, I spoke much too quickly, which is a terrible error. And um, if we can send a recording to people who request it, or the, and and or the slides, I'm fine with that. Um, yeah. So uh, what we'll do for everyone is that, yeah, of course, we are recording this um, this session. I think I may have lost the first thirty seconds because I forgot to hit the uh, the record button, but. Uh, and we've got certainly the vast majority of John's talks, only me that you missed uh, at the very, very start. Um, so we'll send this out to everybody on the list so that you've got a copy of the recording and a copy of, uh, of, of all the questions and all the answers and, uh, and indeed me losing connection to the Zoom call. Um, so if there's uh, no more questions from anyone, I think we'll wrap up this call and then uh, we'll send out the recording to everyone so that uh, people can look at it at, at their leisure. Okay. Cool. Okay. Thanks a lot, everyone. And uh, we'll, send, we'll be in contact soon with, uh, with the slides and with the recording itself. Thanks for the questions, everyone. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. All right. Bye.